I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I'm Shreya Ramakrishnan, Program Manager at the Takshashila Institution, and today I will be in conversation with my colleague Rohan. Hello, my name is Rohan Pai, and I am an Assistant Program Manager at the Takshashila Institution. In today's episode, we will be discussing the principle of secularism and how its meaning changes when instituted across different countries. But let's begin with a current issue in India to start off the conversation. On December 22nd, the Chief Minister of Karnataka, Siddharamaiya, declared that his government would withdraw the ban on hijab in educational institutions. In a post on X, formerly Twitter, Siddharamaiya said a direction had been given to the officials in this regard. However, he backtracked on this decision just a day later and clarified that no official order had been issued yet and a final decision would be taken after a discussion at the government level. So it still remains to be seen whether the ban will actually be revoked. Now to provide some context to our listeners who may be unaware about this. The hijab controversy in Karnataka began in early 2022 in the communally sensitive coastal town of Udupi when a group of female students wearing hijabs were denied entry into their junior college on the grounds that their headscarves violated the institution's uniform policy. This caught attention of the media, even reaching international headlines. Then on February 5th, 2022, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which was ruling in Karnataka at the time, issued an order that said that students in educational institutions should only wear prescribed uniforms. In case there was no school uniform prescribed, they instructed students to wear such attire that would accord with equality and integrity and would not disrupt public order. Now, it's important to note that while the order did not specifically ban the hijab, it roughly translated to mean just that. This decision sparked major backlash, with many accusing the government of preventing Muslim women from being educated. There were also many reports of college authorities prohibiting girls from wearing their dupatta, which is part of the uniform, as a hijab. In response to this, some of the aggrieved students took the matter to the Karnataka High Court. However, in its final judgment on March 5, 2022, the High Court upheld the government order on the grounds that the hijab was not part of the essential religious practice of Islam. Finally, with nowhere else to turn, the petitioners then appealed before the Supreme Court. On October 13th, a two-judge bench comprising of Justice Hemant Gupta and Justice Sidanshu Dolia delivered a split verdict. Justice Hemant Gupta upheld the Karnataka High Court order and argued in favour of the original ban, saying that it was only to promote uniformity and encourage a secular environment in classrooms. On the other hand, Justice Sidanshu Dulia voiced that the education of the girl child was the top priority and disagreed with the state and high court orders. He believed that the right to wear the hijab in classrooms was a matter of choice and a fundamental right linked to the girl's dignity and her privacy, even when she is inside the school gates. The situation as it stands now is still ongoing. Following the split Supreme Court verdict, the matter has now been referred before a larger constitutional bench headed by the Chief Justice of India. The judgment is still pending. Now I'd like to zoom out from this specific issue for a moment and shift the conversation to secularism in general. Let me pose this question to you, Rohan. Isn't India a secular country? What does the word secular mean when the government is interfering in matters of religion? Thank you, Shreya. I think the first way towards understanding the meaning of secularism is through tracing its etymology. When broken down to its roots, the word secular derives from seculum, a Latin word meaning of a generation. This etymological meaning was used to refer to issues of a temporal or worldly nature, as opposed to eternal or otherworldly. The actual term secularism, as we know it today, was coined by a social reformer named George Jacob Holyoke in 1846. Holyoke's definition is loosely related to 
seculum in that he believed that worldly matters such as the ongoing material needs of the poor and working class people should be awarded a higher priority than other worldly matters like the welfare of their souls in the afterlife he used the age of enlightenment as inspiration for the word secularism and defined it broadly as issues of which can be tested by the experience of this life it's important to note however that holyoke's definition did not possess an inherent antipathy towards religion itself rather his motivation was to coin a term that would advocate for human life conducted on naturalistic considerations while simultaneously being tolerant of religion Holyoke found the term atheism too aggravating as he believed it would face backlash from those who were devout Christians and create a division. That's interesting, but I was under the impression that secularism was conventionally understood as a separation of state and religion. When did this definition come into use, especially in a legal sense? Right. So one of the first countries that formally introduced secularism and codified it into law was France. the 1905 french law on the separation of churches and the state as the name suggests kept religion outside the domain of government and legal institutions now just to provide some context about france it has long been one of the principal catholic countries in europe to this day more than 60% of the french population identifies as catholic and until only about 100 years ago it was the official state religion of france however After the new law separated the state from the church, France was officially established as a religiously neutral country, and this gave people the right to freedom of religion for what was probably the first time ever. This form of secularism was known as laicite. Although secularism is often associated with religious freedom today, the underlying objectives of the French law in 1905 or laicite was providing autonomy to the state and eroding the control and influence of the Catholic Church. Now, if we move a little further east, we find that the Republic of Turkey as well was met with similar challenges of state autonomy when it was founded in 1923 with Mustafa Kemal Atatürk as its first president. Atatürk was heavily inspired by the thinkers in France and he grew wary of the superstitious nature of religion. He was adamant in his view that secularism was key to the development and progress of the newly independent Turkish state. So, in what was a very bold decision, Ataturk enforced a strict separationist model of secularism known as laiclik that ruled out Islam as the state religion. This was especially unthinkable at the time given that the region had spent roughly the previous 600 years fostering Islam state relationships. Unlike France however, this form of secularism wasn't solely about gaining more state autonomy. Rather, Ataturk's separationist model was also rooted in objectives of modernization. because he believed that religious institutions had held the country back in terms of progress and secularism would help it catch up with the rest of the world now when we come back to india we find that it differs greatly from turkey and france because it lacked the notion of a state religion prior to the implementation of secularism itself although the country had been under british rule for more than a century its heterogeneous composition of multiple religious groups remained very much intact of course following the partition of india on the day of independence as we all know there was a drastic fall in the percentage of the muslim population accompanied by a rise in the hindu percentage thus in order to soothe the widespread communal tensions and reassure the religious minorities that they had as much equal citizenship as those in the religious majority the indian national congress welcomed the values of secularism and granted religious freedom to all thus india's objective for secularism was not about increasing the power of the state like it was in France or making the country more modern like it was in Turkey but rather to promote religious freedom stay tuned to all things policy we'll be right back after a short commercial break interesting that the same word can have vastly different meanings depending on the country and the context in which it was established what i want to understand is how secularism is carried out in these countries because we often hear in the news that it is ironically the secular countries that are found interfering in matters of religion do you think there's a paradox here yeah i agree there definitely appears to be a paradox at first glance and i think turkey is a great example to answer this question because although turkey was declared a secular state 
thus implying that it would not interfere in matters of religion, it's actually surprising to note that the opposite extreme took place because instead of religion being confined to the private sphere between individuals and concerned religious institutions, Ataturk's regime actually brought it under complete state control. The government of Turkey monopolized every institution with a religious affiliation and he even abolished the caliphate of the Ottoman Empire itself. In place of these institutions, he set up a state-sponsored institution called the Presidency of Religious Affairs of the Republic of Turkey. And what this new measure essentially did was eliminate the middlemen from the equation and grant complete jurisdiction to the state regarding all religious affairs throughout the country. Ironically enough, the separation of religion from the state was no longer a concern because all matters of religion now fell within the ambit of the state. Now that Ataturk had these additional powers to control religion, he proceeded to enforce a host of reforms that thoroughly altered the landscape of Islam in Turkey. These included, but they weren't limited to, replacing the Arabic script with a Latin-based Turkish alphabet and enforcing Turkish words from pre-Islamic times in place of Arabic and Persian words, thus stripping the language of its religious origins. And reforms like these struck at the very root of culture, because those born during this time would receive an education limited to recent secular values, and they would be deprived of the past and traditional knowledge. Additionally, in his mission to westernize the country, Ataturk banned the usage of the fez due to its religious overtones and introduced European-style brimmed hats. These were specifically chosen due to their precarious design and because it prevented people from bowing their heads down in Muslim prayer. This was known as the Hat Law of 1925, and it resulted in both imprisonment and capital punishment of those who violated it. Wow. What about France? Is secularism carried out in a similar fashion? Because when I heard about the hijab controversy in Karnataka, it reminded me of the ban in France. Yes, there are many similarities. Much like the Fez ban in Turkey and the hijab restrictions in Karnataka schools, it has been illegal in France since about 2004 for both students and teachers to wear ostentatious religious symbols within public school premises. This law has often been deemed as Islamophobic for not permitting girls to wear hijab to school and has come under constant scrutiny by the international press and the global Islamic community overall. Now, it must be noted that this claim is untrue in a technical sense because the law equally bans all religious symbols, including yarmulks and crosses. However, when we analyze the law's origins, some of these claims may appear to have a grain of truth in them. Let's see. After North Africa was decolonized in the 1960s, France experienced immigration on a massive scale, leading to the births of some of the first native French Muslims in a predominantly Catholic country. It's important to note that until as recently as 1989, when three girls were suspended from school for refusing to remove the hijab, secularism as such had never been formally discussed in relation to wearing the religious symbols at school. It was only the hijab that prompted it. Moreover, comments made by politicians about the hijab as a symbol of oppression add more weight to this claim about the law being anti-Islam rather than purely secular. Even the recent terrorist attacks that took place in 2015 exacerbated these sentiments in France and resulted in the passing of the anti-separatism bill in July 2021. This bill provides more control to the state to shut down mosques and Islamic private schools that they believe exhibit signs of radicalization. However, given that the interior minister himself said that these signs may include even activities like praying, fasting and growing a beard, the motives behind the bill are kind of questionable. Further, President Macron even pr proposed plans of instituting a state-controlled French Islam and this immediately reminds me of Ataturk's reforms in Turkey, because it speaks volumes about the irony of secular leaders interfering in religious affairs. While Ataturk justified state interference on the grounds of promoting democracy, Macron uses counter-terrorism as a rationale. It's also quite interesting that France has ended up taking after Turkey, given that it was actually Turkey who was the first to be inspired by the French secular model. Interesting. I want to return to India for a moment now. The countries you've talked about so far, such as Turkey and France, are very different from our country because in India, religion and religious symbols are displayed very openly. Why is India categorized as a secular country? 
Right. So I think that speaks to the uniqueness of Indian secularism, because in stark contrast to Turkish and French secularism, it not only permits, but embraces freedom of religious expression in the private and public sphere. Yogi Adityanath, for example, originally a Hindu monk, wears his religion on his sleeve, and he would have been prohibited outright from running for elections in France. Minority religions as well find representation in public institutions through a politician like, say, Asaduddin Oweisi, who wears a long sherwani and an Islamic skullcap as a four-time member of parliament. Self-identification of oneself according to religion is customary in India. In some cases, India's commitment to religious freedom reaches an extreme when it is prioritized over national security. For instance, devout Sikhs are permitted by the state to carry the kirpan, a ceremonial dagger, even on domestic flights for this reason. But France, on the other hand, has unequivocally banned the use of face coverings such as the burqa and niqab on grounds of public safety. Secularism in India, however, has also faced much backlash, with many critics claiming that its addition to the preamble of the constitution in 1976 was motivated by religious appeasement. The founding fathers of India were also wary of using the word secular because they believed that a complete separation of state from religion was unrealistic in the Indian context. Furthermore, the existence of differing personal laws according to religion in India signifies that the secular value of equality of citizenship does not apply in the strictest sense. Now, there is a directive principle in the Constitution of India that would do away with these inconsistencies and impose a uniform set of personal laws for citizens belonging to every religion, and this is called the Uniform Civil Code. But curiously enough, the primary reason it hasn't been enforced yet is due to its apparent anti-secular essence, which is very ironic given that it follows the definition of secularism. To sum up, I think the reason for Indian secularism being so unique traces back to its origins. At the time of independence, secularism was adopted in India purely for the intentions of religious freedom, as opposed to the French model, which was for increasing state autonomy, and the Turkish model, which was for ushering in modernity. Thus, Indian secularism is also paradoxical in a sense, because preserving religious personal laws is often viewed as more secular than eliminating them in the name of equality. Right. So I think at the end of the day, understanding this difference in secularism across countries is important because Indian secularism is very unique. So when issues that concern both state and religion come up, unique solutions have to be explored rather than simply following those in other secular countries. With respect to the possible future of the hijab controversy in Karnataka, I think the statements made by former Advocate General of Karnataka, B.V. Acharya, sum it up well. In a nutshell, he says that if the current state government decides to revoke the original ban from February 2022, then the ongoing appeal in the Supreme Court may become obsolete. And this would be risky because then the Karnataka High Court judgment will stay in force and students will no longer have the opportunity to reverse the order legally. On the other hand, if the High Court order is upheld by the Supreme Court, then college development committees will become more powerful and exercise even more control over what a student can wear to the classroom. We're just going to have to wait and see what the outcome will be. But until then, thank you Rohan for joining me on this episode. This has been a very insightful conversation into the nuances of secularism, its history and background. Thank you for having me, Shreya. And thank you all for listening to this episode of All Things Policy. Stay tuned for more. We have a lot of exciting things planned for 2024. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.